This is Retro Sports Radio. Visit RetroSeasons.com for more sports history. Audio recordings of the radio broadcast of Games 2, 3, and 4 of the 1937 World Series are not known to exist. During those games, the Yankees won Games 2 and 3 to take a commanding 3-0 series lead. After scoring just three runs in the first three games combined, the Giants avoided the sweep by winning Game 4. On October 10, 1937, the New York Yankees faced the New York Giants at the Polo Grounds for Game 5 of the 1937 World Series. The Yankees led the best of seven series three games to one, and this is the NBC radio broadcast of Game 5, featuring announcers Tom Manning, Red Barber, Warren Brown, and George Hicks. We wish to thank H. Fendrick Incorporated for kindly relinquishing half their broadcast period in order that you may hear a description of the World Series game. Charles Wood speaking. Smoke Dreams, originating in the studios of the Nation Station, came to you through the facilities of the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. This is station WMAQ, Chicago. In 10 seconds, it will be 12.45 Central Standard Time, and now for the World Series baseball game. We take you now to the Polo Grounds. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is George Hicks of the NBC, speaking now from the Polo Grounds in New York City. We're about to witness the beginning of the fifth game of the World Series between the New York Yankees and the New York Giants. With the series now standing three games to one in the Yankees' favor, and the victory today for the Yankees, a clinching of the pennant and the championship by winning the first four out of seven. The biggest news this morning that we have is that the weather is wet and chilly, but it's not going to rain this afternoon, and the game is going on. The laughter you just heard a moment ago was for Shaq, who's down on third base now with his baseball uniform on today. No swimming suit today. It's too cold, but still with his uh, his tailcoat with the red lapels, and he's still cat. And he's warming up with the the remnant of the Yankee infield. The regular infield has come in now. And uh, Coach Fletcher is driving ball down at Shaq at third. And Glenn, the catcher, and Shaq uh, engage in a little hot hand as they get closer and closer to each other on the third base line. But uh, to get back to the game, the weather. Well, last night in New York, it started raining, and it rained most of the night. It was raining this morning, and that uh, steady uh, light, but... Uh, the consistent way it has in late fall and uh, up till noon we were still having rain and a heavy overcast sky and the wind coming in from the north and it looked like a pretty bad day for football let alone for a world series game but uh, judge landis came up to the park and it wasn't until 12 30 that he made his decision and decided to have the game played and uh, it's for the benefit of course of the fans who had planned to see big league ball and world series ball this sunday I'm very happy to say that although the crowd is, has been held off by the late decision of whether the game would be played or not, the grandstands are now almost half full. The bleachers are loyal, of course, and packed solid and have been even in the rain. And the sky has cleared up enough so that we feel confident there won't be rain during the game this afternoon. <laughs> now we've got, <laughs> we've got uh, Al Shack out in the pitcher's box now. And he and Glenn, the Yankee catcher, are trying to decide where to put the ball. <laughs> and he Shack through it and it came up here on the second tier behind home plate where we're speaking. Again, this fifth game is being played at the polo grounds on the Manhattan side of the Harlem River. And uh, we can see the huge bulk of the Yankee State stadium looming up across the canal on the other side in the Bronx where we move to tomorrow if the Giants win this game today and it goes to three and two and again the New York Giants here at the Polo Grounds are the home team again they're dressed in their white uniforms and uh, they will field first and of course will bat last as the innings go on we all know the Giants won their first game of the series yesterday by a score of seven to three with Hubble pitching after they'd lost the first three game, and their cause uh, up to then seemed almost hopeless. Uh, we couldn't help but notice that uh, the team has looked a great deal peppier in batting and fielding practice this morning. Uh, old Luke was out there batting them around to the infield. The boys were on their toes. They just pulled the top one off about 15 minutes ago. The infield looks very good. The attendants are now working on it, but they still can't get shacked out of the pitcher's box. 
But I uh, think the feeling among the many fans and the hot stove experts that we find in every office or factory or farm undoubtedly is, as we start the fifth game today, that even with yesterday's win, the odds are, are terrifically heavy against the, against the Giants, especially with the Yanks as their opponents. And if they should and could pull this series out of the fire now, when they're three down, well, it would be the most amazing comeback in World Series history. They, the attendant finally got shacked off the pitcher's box, but no, he's going back now. He's going to argue the point. Uh, he's pushing aside the attendant's tools, and he's going to pitch, but the, but the catcher is now left home plate. We see two southpaws warming up just uh, one to each side of home plate. A long, lanky southern boy from Tennessee with a big blue 16 on his back. He stands six feet four inches. Uh, he has somewhat prominent uh, hearing appendages. Uh, they call him Ears. His name is Cliff Milton or Mountain Music, the freshman star of the Giants who is slated to start pitching this fifth game. And on the other side of the plate, warming up and <laughs> watching shacked over one shoulder to be sure he doesn't get into any trouble, is a smaller built lad, also a southpaw, shooting his ball in very easy now to the catcher, with a big 11 on the back of his gray uniform. Lefty Gomez, who pitched the first game of the World Series, who's never lost a game in the World Series, who won against Hubble 8-1 to one in the first game of this 1930. 37 series. NBC's microphone is again in their box directly behind home plate at the edge of the second tier. Looking out through the mesh screen. And with us are those two redoubtable redheads who flash you the play inning by inning. Tom Manning of Cleveland, veteran baseball describer, and that soft drawling Florida and Cincinnati land, Red Barber of Station WLW. Shaq is getting a nice hand now for his endeavors, and he's got... <laughs> he, the, the attendants have just this moment cleaned home plate, nice and white, and uh, Shaq comes with his spikes and covers it all up again. And with our two redheads is the imperturbable, impartial, Phi Beta Kappa scholar of baseball, Warren Brown, sports editor of the Chicago Herald Examiner, who comes in between the innings to translate the action he's seen into the baseball meaning that he knows. Well, now, the, the diamond's empty, except for the two pitchers warming up. We'll hear the national anthem in a few moments, and then the teams will trot out on the field, and we'll hear the roar that starts the fifth game. Before that takes place, I'd like to turn you to Warren Brown, who, to give us the lineup, any changes, anything that he's found out, digging around the clubhouse and the dugout this morning. But first, Warren, uh, we've been through four games up to now. Uh, what deduction or, or deductions could you make concerning the four games that we've seen played so far? Well, George, I want to thank you first for all those titles that you've given me. It seems as though each day that I come up here, you promote me a little bit higher. Now, getting back to your uh, question about the deductions, the one uh, outstanding characteristic of the World Series of 1937 to date has been the diversity of the playing conditions, weather and track conditions, if I might use that expression. The first game across the Harlem River at the Yankee Stadium was played under a rather excessively hot circumstances. It was very muggy, sultry, and there was plenty of perspiration out on the brows of the players and on the gentlemen of the radio and the press in back of us, no doubt. Then we ran through a a couple of cold days, and today, as George Hicks has told you, there was even a reasonable doubt about the possibility of a game at all until Judge Landis came out here a little afternoon and decided that the game must go on. From the point of view of the New York Yankees, the uh, delay or the playing of the game did not make a great deal of difference since their pitcher, Vernon Gomez, who has not started since the first game of the series, had sufficient rest for all practical purposes. On the other hand, the uh, New York Giants, I have no doubt, would have welcomed the postponement because the postponing of the game today would have given their pitcher, Cliff Melton, an additional day's rest, and we all remember that Melton has already appeared twice in the World Series in a comparatively few days. 
Looking back at the four games that have been played, it is rather interesting to note that going into this game, the fifth, this afternoon, the New York Yankees, who were characterized going into the series as a very powerful team with a more than a suspicion of good pitching, have also appeared in the guise of fielding marbles. Up until the present time, the Yankees have not made an error in the series. That is rather rem a remarkable situation. The Giants, on the other hand, who built their reputation in their National League race on pitching and team spirit and a sturdy defense, have made, uh, well, not many errors, although they did have a wholesale production in two innings of two different games, in which they made three errors in an inning on two occasions of the nine that are now charged against them. Consequently, that has been a little bit of a surprise. There has been a little surprise, too, I think, considering the fact that the polo grounds where the game is being played today and the Yankee Stadium, which is the home of the American League champion, have both been productive through the regular season of a great many home runs. So far, we have seen but two home runs, and the Yankees have had both of them. It just happened that neither one of the home runs, Tony Lazari's in the first game, and Lou Gehrig's homer yesterday, have made any material different in the ball game. There have been no uh, heroic home runs, in other words. Nothing to win the game or nothing to bring the crowd going to its feet. Out in direct center field, Al Shack is leading a cheering section of the bleachers, much after the manner of a football crowd. And truly, this is ideal weather for football. And it's uh, quite a commentary on Shaq's quick wit that he realized that and, and went out there in the deep center field to lead the bleachers into a chair. I think he's getting ready now to get them started again, so let's listen to him. say is rather handily done and while I dare say that the undergraduates in the center field bleacher section of the polo grounds it's, it's difficult competing with this cheering but we must go on the show must go on I think the track at such a time as he completes his splendid career as a baseball comedian can certainly wind up at Yale or California or Stanford or Notre Dame, Wisconsin, Illinois, any place, Duke, that you may think of and take up the life's work as a cheerleader. I don't know of any college cheering section that was able to make so much noise and make the noise in unison with so little rehearsing as this crowd in the center field bleachers at the polo ground. That, I believe, is a tribute to the directing genius, Al Shack. Now, getting back to our base Paul, we have heard and undoubtedly you have read in the last several days about the laxity of hitting on the part of the Giants. I was just looking here at a composite box score of the four games, and I noticed, curiously enough, that there are only four differences in the hit at the present time. The Yankees have made 34 hits, and the Giants have made 30. But the uh, balance of power, nevertheless, has been strongly on the side of the Yankees. And going into today's game, which is, uh, is the last at the polo grounds, regardless of what transpires here. The Yankees are the really the favorites. They have to be regarded as the favorites. They've won three out of the four games. They need but one more to gain the World Championship. Over the uh, amplifying system at the present time, the announcer has been giving you the batteries, which will be Cliff Melton and Harry Danning for the Giants and Vernon Gomez and Bill Dickey for the Yankees. Yesterday, Harry Danning, along with Hank Lieber, got into the Giant lineup for the second time, did most of the hitting that turned back the tide of Yankee power and made it necessary to play today's game, the National Anthem.
almost ready to begin. The Giants, the home club, are rushing out of the field. So I'm going to turn you over now to the very efficient services of Tom Manning, give you the lineup and the detail of the ball game. All right, Tom. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Well done, Warren Brown. Here's the lineup. In the field for the first half of the first inning will be the National League entry, the Giants. Moore, left field. Martell, short. Hot, third base. Here's a change in the lineup. Ripple, right field, batting ahead of center fielder Lieber. So that'll be Moore, Martell, Hot, Ripple, Lieber. McCarthy, first base. Danny, catch. Whitehead, second. And Melton, long, lean, left-hander in the box. For the Yanks, Rosetti at short. Rolf, DiMaggio, center. Gehrig, first. Dickey, catch. Hold, left field. Selkirk, right. Mazzari, second. Gomez, pitch. The umpires behind the plate will be Ormsby. First base will be Barr. Second base, Basil. And at third base, it'll be Stewart. Everybody in position. Dick Bartell has just tossed the ball to Melton. Umpire Red Ormsby has adjusted his paraphernalia. Frankie Cosetti steps into the batter's box. And the wind-up the ball game is on the pitch. It's a long drive going deep into left field back. Joe Moore is back under it, and he takes it. One away, Frankie Cosetti stepping into that first ball pitch. And it was a long drive to left field that Joe Moore was off under and caught for the first out. Frankie Cosetti had one hit out of 17 times at bat. Now third baseman, Red Roth. Red has five bingles out of 17 times at bat. Here's the pitch. It's a strike. Ball. Cliff Belton, left-hander in the box, standing, catching, and Rolf, the Yank third baseman, left-hand batter, is at the plate. Inside, ball. Ball one, and strike one. Rolf, pumping that old bat up and down, one and one, coming. It's a base hit between third and short into left field. Two more retrieves the ball. Rolf rounds first. The throw is to Bartell at second. And it's a single for Rolf. Joe DiMaggio coming up. Something wrong with Joe's bat. After walking clear up to the plate. Oh, he threw the wrong bat away. Each of the players, you know, come up there with two or more bats. Joe tossed the wrong one over the dugout. And hadn't noticed it until he got clear up to the plate. Now he's in there, ready to go. It's the first inning of this fifth game of the World Series. Yanks batting Rolf on first, one out. Melton takes the stretch, and here it is. It's a high fly ball to short center field. Everybody's after it, everybody's after it. And finally, Whitehead makes a beautiful running catch way out in center field. Whitehead taking that ball to the foot out. And that's the roar of the crowd is for Whitehead. That looked awful bad for a moment. With center fielder Lieber coming in. Burgess Whitehead dashed out there at the last moment. He made up his mind to keep on going, and he grabbed that ball with his back to the plate. Lara Bing, Lou Gehrig of Columbia coming up. Joe DiMaggio had five out of 17. Now we have Gehrig at bat. Gehrig has three out of 13. Some spectator let go of the Sunday newspaper, and there's plenty of paper flying out there in center field, and three of the ground keepers are running out there. Chase looked like a flock of ducks when it first came out of the stands. Well, they've retrieved the last bit of it now, and there's a round of applause for them. The boys are still running off the field. We were detained while they retrieved that blowing paper out there. Lou Gehrig at bat, two out, and we have Rolf on first base. Here's the pitch. Strike. A sharp, breaking curveball that had Gary pulling away from the plate. It caught the inside corner, and Ormsby called to the strike. Two out. Rolf is on first. Here it is. Outside. Ball one, and strike one. This is the third appearance in this series of Cliff Melton. Open the second game and relieve them the third. Ball one, strike one, play at first base. It's not even close. 
Ball one and strike one on Lou Gehrig, the batter. The Yanks are batting in the first inning. Again, Melton tosses over to McCarthy. That time, Rolf was standing there with his foot on the bag. Heavy wind blowing. Another play at first. This one's closer, but he's safe. The heavy wind blowing, and that's a distinct advantage for the left-hand hitters. There's a stretch, and here it is. Outside, almost a wild pitch. Nice stop by catcher Harry Danning. All two and strike one. Danning stands there with his glove off, now rubbing the ball up before tossing it out there to Cliff Milk. It's Lou Gehrig batting, ball two and strike one. Two out, and Walt is on first base. A stretch coming. Ball three, that's a wild pitch. He's going down the throw. He's flying. He's safe. I believe that that will be scored as a wild pitch. We'll get the official decision for you in a moment. Let go, ball two and strike one. Look, Milton let go with a curve ball. It was low outside. And Rolf went to second. Now it's the count is three and one. The official scores are still... Wild pitch is correct. Here we go. Ball four. Another sweeping curve ball. Missed the outside corner. With a runner on second base, Cliff Mountain was taking no chance. And slamming that ball down through the middle to Gary for the count three and one. He threw a slow, sweeping curve ball. It was outside. That brings Bill Dickey to bat. Bill has four hits out of 16 times at the plate. First base from McCarthy playing way back, giving Gary a big lead. Here it is. Strike. Ball. Sharp breaking curve ball that Milton had in there over the inside corner to Bill Dickey, a left hand batter. Rolf is on second. Gary is on first. It's the first inning. No score. Two men out. Outside. Ball one and strike one. Red Rolf is on second. Gary Gunn, first two out, ball one, strike one, pitch. It's the top ball down first, it's ball and strike two. Earl Combs coaching at first base, retrieves that ball. The diamond is well soaked. The only thoroughly dry spot on the diamond there is the pitching rubber and the spot around home plate. Strike two and ball one, ready to go again. Two out, Rolf on second, Gary on first. Melton takes a stretch. Strike two and ball one. Inside, ball two. Cliff barely aimed that ball over the inside to Bill Dickey. Once again, Harry Danning has his big mitt off, standing there rubbing the ball with his bare hands before tossing it out to Melton. Dickey steps out of the batter's box. It's ball two and strike two. Two men on. Two men out. A clock of deuces. All right, it's two and two. Coming. Strike three. Oh! Stop breaking for a ball and throw Dickey. Three and it was a strike. Just stuck his head and ran for the Yankee dugout. So that's all for the Yanks in the first inning. No runs, one hit, one base on balls, and no errors. Warren. Melton certainly worked himself out of a rather difficult position there in this inning, especially pitching to Bill Dickey, who was one of the more powerful hitters in this New York Yankee lineup. I noticed that in the first inning, Melton was throwing more curves, I think, than fastballs. He threw curves almost exclusively to Gehrig when he walked him, and that was about all that Dickey had, save one fastball that came in around his ankles. That last curve was a beautiful thing, breaking sharply over the plate, and it fooled Dickey completely. Melton certainly has started out his first inning while he was in a little trouble with no sign that the uh, three appearances which he's been forced to make in this 1937 World Series have cramped his style any. He began with a rush, and now we'll have a look at Gomez making his second appearance in the World Series. Gomez was very effective his first time out over in the Yankee Stadium, and since he is tremendously fast, one of the swiftest pitchers in the American League, this dark day, which is supposed to be ideal for 
That pitching ought to be right down Gomez Alley, much as it is down Melton. The first giant batter is about at the plate, Tom, so I guess you can take charge again. No scores yet. We're going into the last half of the first inning, and Joe Moore, left fielder of the Giants, will hit first. Joe gets a nice round of applause from the fans here. I believe about 35,000 in the polo ground. Gomez winding up the pitch. It's a base hit in the left field. A base hit. Oh, pummel the ball momentarily, picks it up, returns it to Lazari, and it's a single for Joe Moore. He's walking clear into the pitching rubber, rubbing it up before handing it to Gomez. That was a line drive that shortstop Frankie Crosetti leaped far to his right floor, but missed it by several feet. Ball went bounding out to left field, where it was retrieved by Holt. All right, we have Mark, Dick Martella for the strike one, swinging. Martella's a right hand batter. Four has six hits out of 18 times at bat, and Bartell has four out of 17. Gomez takes a stretch, and here it is. The high fly ball to left field. Ho gets under it, running in, still coming in. Makes the catch, he's out. Ball was hit pretty hard. There's a wind blowing in from left field. Ho started to slow up for that catch, then had to hurry a little bit to catch up with it. Still have more on first, one man out, and Mel out. Left hand batter and third baseman coming up. Mel has three hits out of 17 times at bat. Strike one. Took a healthy cut from way back at that ball. We have no scores yet. We're playing the last half of the first inning. The Giants batting one out, and Moore is on first base. Inside. All one, and strike one. Lefty Gomez pitching for the Yankees, and Bill Dickey behind the bat. Gomez, ready? There it is. Foul up and back. Up and back and home plate. A bit of a scramble going on for it. It makes the count on Mellot. Strike two and ball one. We have right fielder Jimmy Ripple coming up next. Notice how fast Gomez is pitching. Right three. Mellot going for a bad ball high on the outside. That was really a bad ball high on the outside. Mel started a swing, couldn't hold, followed through, and looked just a little bad on that strikeout. Two gone. Jimmy Ripple coming up. He has three hits out of 13 trips to the plate. It's a base hit in the right center field. Four rounding seconds. DiMaggio has the ball. The throw is the third. The throw is cut off by Frankie Cosetti. And it bounds away from Cosetti over to the pitcher's box where Rolf pounces on it. Ripple stopping at first. Four. On third base, Ripple on first, and Lieber coming up. Both of those giant hits were ringing line drives. One by Moore over Cosetti's head. This one by Ripple over Lazari's head. Maggio came up with that ball and cut loose of it quick, but Cosetti, playing heads up, seeing that there was no chance of getting more at third base, cut that ball off. So as to prevent Ripple from going to second and be in a scoring position. Hank Lieber, you know, it's a right-hand batter. He has two hits out of seven times up. Two very important hits they were, too. The stretch and the pitch outside, ball one. Lefty Gomez in the box for the Yanks. Outfielders are playing plenty deep. There it is. Strike, he swings hard and misses. Ball one and strike one. Hank Lieber has stepped out of the batter's box for a moment. Tense moments indeed. Two out, runners on first and third, one and one coming. Ball two. That ball was over, but just a little bit high. Ball two and strike one. Merle Hogue is playing way out there, the 400-foot sign. DiMaggio has moved out, too. They're playing direct position, though, left, center, and right. All right, ball two and strike one. The high infield fly near first base. On the line is Garrick waiting, and Garrick takes it. That's all for the Giants in the first inning. No runs, two hits, and no errors. One. The thing worth uh, commenting on in that inning is the change of tactics. 
on the part of the New York Giants. Rather, it is a return to the tactics that they used while they were in their regular play in the National League season. Joe Moore, their leadoff man, has established a record down through the years of liking to take a whack at that first ball. We've been watching him all through this series, and Joe has been letting the first ball go by more often than not. Today, perhaps Gomez thought he was going right on too with that and came in there with it, and Moore got his base hit. The other uh, mark change is their lack of respect today, or at least in this first inning, for the throwing arms of the Yankee outfielders. You may have remembered from listening to the broadcast of the other games that the Giants seldom tared to take that extra base. Today, Moore kept right on going in spite of the fact that the ball was hit at DiMaggio, who was supposed to have the best throwing arm in the major leagues. All right, Tom, the ready to go again. Well, hold the first hitter, right hand batter, the wind up and the pitch. All one. Pass ball outside. Well, has five hits out of 16 times at bat. No score yet. First man up for the Yanks in the second inning. Here it is. Inside and it's ball two. Sweeping curve ball that Earl Holt, right hand batter, watched all the way, then stepped away from it as it was too close and inside. Ball two, the count. Strike. Fast ball right down the alley. Cliff Milton pulls the string on that one. Ball two and strike one. Here it comes. There's a long drive going deep into right field. High up in the right field. Reaches for a home run. A home run by Earl Holt, the left field of the Yankees. That ball by Merle Holt, the right-hand hitter. The count ball two and strike one was in the upper deck, well over in right field. The blow traveling perhaps about 450 feet. One to nothing in favor of the Yanks. Selkirk, right fielder, left hand batter is up. Ball one. Fast ball at Max Selkirk, away from the plate. Playing the first half of the second inning, the score one to nothing in favor of the American League entry. The result of that mighty home run by Merle Holt. Cliff Milton, southpaw, pitching. Ball one, the count. Ball two. And a fastball inside, and the count is two and nothing. Tony Rosari hanging around. He'll bat next. Ball two. Strike. Fastball right down the middle and fell high on the count on Georgie Selkirk. Ball two and strike one. George steps away from the plate, wipes his hands on his trousers, back in there ready to go. Ball two and strike one. Bounding ball down towards second. Whitehead comes up with it to throw. He's out. Whitehead to McCarthy. George Selkirk rounding out. One gone. Nobody on. Rosalia. Tony has five hits out of 12 times at bat, getting a nice round of applause. You've got Teddy Selkirk had four hits out of 15 times at bat. Mike was early up. Strike. Last ball, just above the knees, over the outside corner. First half of the second inning. The foul ball. Fine drive into the right field corner. That's strike two on Lazelli. The low line smash that had the spectators scattering. Here it comes. Foul up and back. Hits the screen right in front of the microphone here. The score is one to nothing in favor of the New York Yankees. First half of the second inning, one man out. Nobody on was Elliot Bat, but strike two. The wind up. Strike three, call. It's a beautiful curveball. Tony Lazari knew it. That's bowed his head as much as to say, absolutely correct, and walked away. Both of those strikeouts, Dickey and Lazari, no question in the mind of the batter. They're very definite in their own minds that it was the third strike. Now you have Gomez coming up. Two out, nobody on. Left-handed 
lefty bats and throws left handed. Two out, nobody out, and here we go. Ball one, sweeping curve ball. Lefty Gomez started to swing at that. Harry Danning turned around, claiming that it was a strike, but Ormsby said nay. Here we go. Foul, strike one. Ball one and strike one. Third ball inside. Gomez swinging hard. Top the ball. First half of the second inning. Run to nothing in favor of the Yankees. Two out and nobody on. Strike two, the count. Ball. a mix-up on the decision on those balls and strikes there. He called that first one a ball, but they have strike two and ball one on the board. That was a tip ball, so it doesn't make any difference now. That first pitch that Danning claimed might have been a strike, Ormsby held up his left hand, which means that it was a ball. Makes no difference. It's strike two and ball one. Here it comes. Strike three. Call. Oh. A sharp breaking curve ball at Gomez allowed to pass by, and it's no, no one run, one hit, and no errors for the Yanks in the second one. And the home run that we talked about in advance of the game has finally made its appearance in the World Series at a point where it really means something. Merle Hoke's line shot over there into the upper deck of the right field stand. Starting the Yankees off, one run to the good is the first home run of the three made in the series that had material effect upon the game. At the present time, except for that home run, Nelson seems to be pitching very well out there. He has his control back. He doesn't even seem to be as unsteady as he was in the first inning. Against the right-hand hitters, it looks to me as though he's been pitching outside to them, particularly to Hope, to keep him from pulling into left. But the California boy simply stuck out his bat and poked the ball into the right field stand. He's got his home run over there, so I guess it doesn't make much difference. If they're going to hit him, they're going to hit him, whether you pitch inside or outside. Here are the Giants coming up for their turn, and it's your turn, Tom. It'll be Johnny McCarthy, the giant first baseman leading off in the last half of the second. McCarthy, Danning, and Whitehead coming up. For the late tuners in again, that Yankee outfielders hold left, DiMaggio center, Selkirk in right. Carrig at first, Lazari second, Rosetti short, Rolf third, and the battery is Lefty Gomez and Bill Dickey. Umpire Ormsby behind the plate calls, play ball, and here we go. A foul back, strike one. Johnny McCarthy is a tall, lanky boy. Bats and throws left-handed. Mack has had four hits out of 15 times at bat. A bounding ball down between first and second. Lazari has it to throw to Garrick, and he's out. Run away, nobody on. Harry Danning coming up. Harry Danning having replaced Gus Mancuso. Gus was injured. The little finger of his right hand. Danning making a very acceptable substitute. Right hand batter, the first pitch. Outside, ball one. Last half of the second inning, the score one to nothing in favor of the Yankees. The Giants at bat, one out, nobody on. Danning hitting, and it's ball one. Foul ball. Hard smash down, right field. Curving into the stands, it's ball one and strike one. Here comes. Strike two. Danning was awful bad on that one. He swung a split second too late. Wouldn't be surprised if it's pretty tough to see that ball out there. Gomez, speedball pitcher, and it's awful dark here in New York. Strike three. Out of the ball. Felt higher. Without a hop on it for the third strike. That's the second strike out for Gomez. Melvin Ott and Harry Dan. Burgess Whitehead coming up. Burgess has three hits out of 12 times at bat. Right hand hitter. Giant half of the second, two out, nobody on. 
High fly ball, right field, looks like a Texas League hit, it is. Texas League hit, right hand is rounded. First and he's going to second, there's the throw, he's safe, a two-bagger. That was a high pop uh, fly down in right field. Gary was off with a crack of the bat, Selkirk also. Both of them came over there, and neither Gary or Selkirk got within 20 feet of that ball. It was finally retrieved by Selkirk, flipped into the infield, and it's a two-base hit for Whitehead. We have the pitcher Cliff Melton coming up. This being a full day, it's going to take the pitchers quite some time to get up to the plate because they're wrapped in their heavy sweater and a big blanket at the completion of each inning. Bill Dickey, Gomez, and umpire Ormsby all standing halfway between the plate and the box discussing something, and Ormsby is looking at the ball. Everything's okay. They're going back to their positions now. Gomez has his glove off, rubbing that ball up. Dalton steps in the box. We're ready to go. Ball one. Sweeping curve ball is high and outside. It's the giant half of the second inning. Two outs. Whitehead on second. Strike. Took, took a mighty cut at that one. It was ball one and strike one. One and one. The pitcher batting. Strike two, he swings hard again. Lefty Gomez has got a lot of speed out there this afternoon. Every afternoon, too. Ball is too high, a change of pace offering. Tried to fool Cliff Melton with that one, it was strike two and ball two. Two and two. Strike three, he's out. Whitehead on second base, Gomez, and Melton. This game, you know, is coming to you from the Polo Grounds of New York City, the fifth game of the World Series between the Giants and the Yankees. And it's being sent to you over the combined red and blue network of the National Broadcasting Company. We pause now for station identification. This is station WMAQ, Chicago. Back at the Polo Grounds, the NBC booth in the upper deck, watching the progress of the game between the New York Yankees and the New York Giants. The Yankees at the present time are leading by one to nothing because of a home run delivered in the second inning by Merrill Hogue, their left fielder. Both lefty Gomez and Cliff Melton, the pitchers, are progressing very favorably at the present time. There is no criticism to make of their pitching. Yankees are at that now and Tom Manning. First half of the third inning, the top again, Frankie Crosetti. Strike one, he cuts hard the first ball pitch. Last time up, Frank by to left field. Also, that time was bad, he hit the first ball pitch. Strike one, inside, and it's ball one. Ball one and strike one. Cliff Melton pitching. Here we go. Ball one. That ball was over the plate, but too low. Last time up, Bill Dickey struck out. There it is. High foul at back of the plate. Danning coming back. He's under it. We ought to get it. He does. He's out. Bill Dickey falling out to catcher Danning. Well, the home run hitter, Merle Hope, coming up. Merle's right hand batter. Last time up, of course, he had his home run, giving him six hits out of 17 times at bat. Melton's first delivery, inside, ball one. First half of the fourth inning, the Yanks are batting. Score two and two, one man out, nobody on. Ball one on the hitter. There it goes, it's a long drive to left, but this time Moore is over near the wall and makes the catch. Moore was hit in a good spot, ordinarily a base hit, but this time Joe Moore was playing over there close to that 360-foot sign there and ran over against the billboard to make the catch. Georgie Selkirk at bat. Last time up, George bounded it out, Whitehead to McCarthy. Four hits out of 16 trips to the plate. All one. Change of pace, curveball, sort of a sweeping thing that came at the batter and then brushed inside, but not quite enough. And it's ball one. Strike. 
beautiful fastball right down the alley and felt high. Ball one and strike one. Two out, nobody on. High foul ball between third and home. I believe Danning will take it out as in there. Danning takes it. That's all for the Yanks. That was quick. No runs, no hits, and no errors. Warren Brown. Tom, I suppose you've noticed in that inning that Melton seemed to be faster than he was at any time in the ball game. Those three hitters, one after the other, all failed to get their bats around, as the saying is. The ball was past them before they got a good cut at it. And the result were those up flies, two of them to the catcher, and a sort of a soggy one. Really, I think Hogue hit that ball on the handle. It went out into left field. That is a good indication that Melton is still a very strong pitcher, and I think this is really a remarkable thing on his part because after all three appearances in five games, there's a lot of work from a pitcher. On the other hand, up to the present time, the Giants seem to be hitting Gomez, I'd say, steadily, certainly more steadily than they did when they first faced him over at the Yankee Stadium in what now seems like the long ago, doesn't it, Tom? Indeed it does, and we're going into the last half of the fourth inning. That score is all tied up two and two. We have McCarthy, Johnny McCarthy leading off, Harry Danning second, and Whitehead third. Gomez, the first pitch, strike call. Sharp breaking curve ball that Johnny pulled away from and broke over the heart of the plate for a call strike. Here it is. Ball outside. It's one and one. Last half of the fourth inning. Johnny McCarthy leading off for the Jins. Strike two. Johnny waved at that one. Last curve ball over the outside corner, and it's strike two and ball one. Strike three. He waved at that one. Took a very beautiful cut at it, however. Didn't miss it by very much. That's the third strike out of the afternoon for Gomez. Score the Yanks two, the Giants two. Last half of the fourth inning, one out. Standing up, hits the first ball. It's a foul over in the boxes and back of first base. Strike one. Lefty Gomez taking his time before the next delivery to Harry Danning. Now we're ready. It's strike one, you know. Ball inside. Ball one in, strike one. One man out. Winding up. Ball outside. Ball two and strike one. Snyder and Luke doing the coaching for the Giants as usual. Lefty Gomez pitching. Ball two, strike one. Strike two. The roar from that crowd was from the fact that Harry Danning was fooled on that pitch and looked awful bad swinging at it. He swung late and swung at least a yard over that ball. That is sometimes caused because the batter sprang out, guess the pitcher. Our ball in the box is over and back of first. Ball one and strike two. Of that swing, Harry was expecting a sharp breaking curve ball instead of that. Gomez stuck it over the outside corner. But felt high. Two and two. Tip ball back. It remains two and two. The count is two and two. The score is Giants two, the Yankees two, and we're in the last half of the fourth inning, and we have one man out and nobody on. Harry Danning. Twisted himself a little bit and swinging at that ball. He's standing out of the batter's box. Now he's ready to go again. Two and two. It's a long fly going out to right field. But it's foul. Foul by only a foot. Danning was all the way down to first base. That ball hit the top of the scoreboard in the right field corner. That was up over the 294 foot side. It was a ringing line drive. Everybody jumped to their feet expecting the ball to drop over the top of the barrier out there for another home run. But it hit only inches from the top and only about one foot foul. Now he's taking a lot of time coming back from first base. The ball was hit like a shot out of a cannon. 
When we go again, it'll be ball two, strike two, one out, and nobody on. And here we go. That's a line smash over in the boxes in back of third base. It's a foul. There's anybody over there trying to catch that ball, I'll tell you. Now he's got his eye on the ball. It's two and two. Gomez winding up. There we go. High foul ball coming back. Dickey coming back fast. He has it. That was so close to the stands here that we had to wait for the roar of the crowd that time. We couldn't see it, so we have two out, nobody on, and Gorgeous Whitehead coming up. Two men out. Whitehead coming up. Last time up, Whitehead had a double. Last half of the fourth inning, Giants batting. The score is two and two. We have two men out, nobody on. Ball one. That ball was over the plate, a little bit too low. Seems to be getting just a little darker now than it was at the start of the game. That wind is raw and cold. Ball two. Whitehead started a swing at that, and this time he was able to hold the swing back. That's the first time in the series, as we remember, that the boys started a swing and were able to hold it. Two and nothing to count. That's a shot to right for the foul. One of the groundkeepers out there comes up with a little uh, Charleston after that one, shivering from getting out of its way. Groundkeepers are sitting right out there close to the foul line on the right field corner. It's ball two and strike one. Ready? The long smack to right field, right at Georgie Selkirk, and he takes it so high, a line drive that he never moved for. That's all for the Giants for the fourth inning. No runs, no hits, and no errors. Missed the Brock. And because, Tom, there was no runs, no hits, no errors, and nobody on base, obviously it was a pitcher's inning rather than a hitter. I have no doubt that the darkness of the afternoon had some effect on the swinging. I think some of the boys that have been batting down here have taken almighty cuts at pitches that ordinarily they must let go by. Some of them they've missed by several feet. Some of them have been bad pitches, <laughs> and it's it's really dark, and at the present time, there is a little sprinkle of rain starting to come down, which I dare say will add to the confusion in a very short order. The Yankees are coming to bat again against Cliff Melton of the Giants, and Tom, I guess maybe you better come in out of the rain, go to work, huh? What do you mean, come in out of the rain? <laughs> Our microphone is right out here in the open at the polo grounds over at the Yank Stadium. It's undercover, but over here it's right out in the open, so you'll hear the bitter patter of the rain hitting the dry fire with the old mic when we get going. Do you get your fireman's hat? Well, we can take it. Ready to go. First half of the fifth. It's two and two. And push him up. Tony Lazari is at bat. Last time up, Tony struck out. He's called out on a ball that Melton had over the outside corner. Inside, ball. Ball one and strike one. First half of the fifth inning, Missouri the first batter up. There's a high fly ball going deep. Going out, out, Lieber going back, way back. He doesn't make the catch. Missouri is round at first. Lazari is round at second. Here's the relay. Whitehead goes out, and Lazari stops at third base. A mighty triple from 450 feet from home plate. The crack of that bat. Triple. The right fielder, Lieber the center fielder, set sail for the ball, but triple. Or Lieber, neither one of them can catch up with it. And it landed out there just about one yard from the barrier in left field. That's about 450 feet from home plate was really hit. You really got to hit them to get them over that barrier, and then it's about uh, 12 feet high after you uh, get to the furthest extent of the line between home plate and center field. Tony Mazzelli is on third base, and we have Gomez coming up. That's the fourth Yankee hit of the afternoon. Zip Hump was taking a lot of time before tossing that first ball up to Lefty Gomez. Infield. They're going to move in, of course. Trying to cut that run off with Zoe. 
We know he's on third base. Nobody out. The score is tied two and two. Here we go. The line drive and the base hit. Roger Whitehead got his glove hand on that ball, but it was kicked like lightning. And the base hit in the center field. And Lazari scores from third base. The Yankees of the American League three and the Giants of the Master League two. The result of Lazari's triple and with the infield drawn in, Lefty Gomez swung hard and hit a lightning smash that second baseman Whitehead just barely got his glove hand on and batted it out into center field. It hit so hard that if it had been right at him, it probably would have knocked him down. First half of the fifth inning, nobody out. Gomez is on first and we're delayed for a moment while Lefty Gomez, the Yank pitcher, gets his sweater on. He's got it on now and all buttons up and we're ready to go. Up comes the top again, Frankie Crosetti. No hits out of two times at bat. One hit out of 19 times at bat in series. It's a strike call. Last ball right down the alley. First time up, Frankie flies to left field. The next time up, he fouled it out. Hot to McCarthy. Here it comes. The high fly ball in the short right field. Ripple coming in fast. Willie Aroni is coming in. A nice running catch by Ripple. Came in on the dead run and he's getting a nice round of applause. He was playing rather deep for Frankie Cosetti. Frank dropped that ball in the short right field with Ripple off with a crack at the bat coming in and taking the ball at top speed. One man out. Lefty Gomez is on first and red ball for left hand batter coming up. a single and struck out out of two times at bat this afternoon. Six hits out of 19 times at bat. It's a strike call. Sharp breaking curve ball that Roth pulled away from. The ball broke over the inside corner for a call strike. Outside and it's ball. Ball one and strike one. half of the fifth inning, the score, the Yankees of the American League three, the Giants of the National League two. One man out, Gomez is on first, Rolf at bat, ball one, strike one. It's inside, ball two. This boy Cliff Melton, big gangling youngster, takes a lot of time walking around out there just as cool as a cucumber. Very nonchalant. A stretch... Outside and the ball three. Three and one. Harry Danning, giant catch, is walking all the way up the pitcher's box now before tossing the apple back to Melton. Mellon is walking in part way to the pitcher's box from third base. And the count will be ball three and strike one. A little drizzle of rain continues. Very high wind. Still just as dark as up. Ball three and strike one. Gomez on first, one out, we're ready to go. Ball hitting. Inside, ball four, and he walks. Lefty Gomez advancing to second. And Joe DiMaggio coming up and getting a nice round of applause. Listen to it for a moment. Boys on first and second, one out the stretch, and here it is. Outside, ball one. The fans here are not sitting back in their chairs half asleep this afternoon. I'll tell you. One man out, one is on first and second. The stretch, here it is. The high infield fly ball. Everybody's after it, looks like it's an automatic out, of course, but Danning finally makes the catch. Runners on first and second, the infield fly rule is prevalent there. Two men out. In other words, it would have made no difference whether or not anybody caught that ball. We're in the fifth inning, you know, we have two men out now. The score, three to two in favor of the Yankees of the American League. We have Lalloping Lou coming up, left-hand batter so far this afternoon. Lou drew a base on balls and then struck out. Gomez is on second base. Rolf is on first. 
There it is. It's a ball. Sharp breaking curve ball. It was too high. Mighty Luke Carrick leaning over that plate there. That's a left hand, you know. Waving that bat up and down. Here it comes. He swings and misses. Strike one. Ball one and strike one. That was a pitch inside. Not matter high that Gary tried to pull. Runners on first and second, two out. Ball one and strike one. Mighty new Gary at the plate. And here it is. There it goes. It's a base hit in the right center field. Lieber going after the ball. Gomez is round at third. Ball is round at second. Here's the relay. Ball round at third and had to slide back. It's a two base hit for Gary, sending Gomez across the plate. Ball stopping at third. Gary getting a double. Score the Yankees four and the Giants two. Gehrig is on second, Rolf is on third. Bill Dickey at bat. Pretty fast beating by Lieber out there. That ball was hit right in the hole between left and center field. Lieber going over there fast to take that ball on the run. He got it back to that infield plenty fast. This boy Rolf is a speed merchant. All right, Dickey at bat. First pitch wide, ball one. Wide sweeping curve ball. It was about four feet outside of the plate. The New York Yankees four and the New York Giants two. First half of the fifth inning, two out, runners on second and third. Bill Dickey at bat. Lever and Ripple playing very, very deep. Here it comes. Inside. Ball two. Merle Hope coming up next. Yanks have made three hits and have a base on balls this inning. Ready to go again. Melton took a lot of time before delivering this one. It's ball two and here it is. Ball three. Trying to keep that ball over the inside corner to Bill Dickey. Bag on Occupy, he probably won't give him anything too good. Strike. Curveball at this time, he caught the inside corner, and it's ball three and strike one. Rolf is standing in third, Gary Gunn second. Ball four. Ball is plenty wide of the plate. Now we have the bases loaded, and the home run hitter, Earl Hope, coming up. Second base on ball at the sitting for the Yankees. Now we have a play at every base. The score is four to two, you know, in favor of the Yankees. First half of the fifth inning, two men out. Rolf on third. Gehrig is on second. Dickey is on first. Oh, right hand batter is up. Cliff Melton, giant pitcher, turned around, looked at the outfield for a moment. Left hand are warming up out there for the Giants. Here we go. High foul ball. Danning is going over fast. He is under it, and he has it. That's all for the Yankees in the fifth inning. Two runs, three hits, two bases on balls, and no errors. At the conclusion of four and a half innings to score, the Yankees of the American League four, the Giants of the National League two. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Tom Manning speaking to you. I've had the pleasure of broadcasting the first four and one half innings, and the last four and a half will be sent to you through the medium of the voice of Red Bob. This is the fifth game of the World Series between the Yanks and the Giants being played at the Polo Grounds in New York City. It's being sent to you over the combined blue and red network of the National Broadcasting Company. And once more, we pause for station identification. This is station WMAQ, Chicago. Back in the NBC booth at the Polo Grounds as we are ready to go into the last of the fifth inning. Cliff Melton is slated to be the first hitter up for the Giants as for the second time this afternoon. The Giants in this very crucial ball game, which may mean the series or may mean a continuation of it, find themselves two run behind. 
early in the afternoon, after the Yankees had hit two battering home runs, the Giants came from behind two to nothing as Ott with Bartell on first and one out in the third, hammered a home run for the only Giant four master of this 1937 Fall Classic. And now as the Giants come in from the last to the fifth, they are again behind by two runs as the Yankees have turned on more power, getting two runs in the top of the fifth. It is four to two in favor of the Yankees. Melton slated to hit first, last to the fifth, and then the top of the order, Joe Moore, who has by one the most base hits of any player in the series. But it looks as though Melton will not bat. Apparently, there's going to be a pinch hitter coming up. And it is Blondie Ryan who is going to be first up in the last of the fifth inning. Blondie Ryan, who hits right-handed, who was the talisman, the good luck charm of the Giants on an earlier pennant campaign in the National League, who made famous the cry, they can't beat us. And it's Blondie Ryan coming up to the plate, his first appearance in this 1937 World Series. Hitting right-handed and first First up, Lefty Gomez pitches. Ryan takes strike one call. A sharp curve down on the inside, just above the knees. Gomez, an easy swinging stretch. Dickey comes out of his crouch. Pitches low for ball one. One and one. It's rather customary for balls to be given ahead of strikes, and we bow to custom. One and one. I feel the straightaway are not particularly deep in center. The match will in fairly close, closer than usually plays. The pitch swung on, lifted high and foul into the seats. Back of first base. Not one and two as Ryan is behind. Ball one, strike two. Melton, after five innings, is finished. Melton, in those five innings, gave up four runs all earned on six hits, struck out five. Here's the pitch. High outside, the gap levels. Two and two. Melton walked three men. A great deal of stuff, but he made a couple of pitches with the Yankees singing their theme song, I like Mountain Music, got a hold of. Ryan swings and misses for strike three. Lefty Gomez strikes off Blondie Ryan, first up in the last of the fifth inning. And that for Gomez is his fifth strikeout of the afternoon, achieved in four and a third round. It is four to two, favor of the Yankees, who have won three games already. The Giants behind two runs have won just one game. Joe Moore, who has the most hits of any player in the series, is up batting left-handed. Takes high up above the peak of his cap. Ball one. Gomez fast ball failed to sink at all. Dickey walks a couple of steps out in front of home plate. Returns to lefty. Lefty working as usual in quick movements. Looks down, takes the sign. Without wasting any further time, delivers. It's inside up against the letters, and Moore leans back from it. Two nothing. Two balls. No strikes. The outfield is pulled a little around toward right. However, Hogan left is staying straight away. Joe Moore hits to both fields. Joe chokes that bat. Takes inside again. He's ahead 3 nothing. Gomez shakes his head. You say, I don't like that. This is the kind of a ball game that anything can suddenly pop up in, apparently. Gomez pitching 3 nothing. Gets it in there for the automatic strike. More taking, of course. 3 and 1. The pitch is swung on and the line drive puts it safely out of the center field for a solid base wrap. The match takes on the third bound, throws into second to Lazari, and Moore with his eighth hit of the series. Sharp line drive, close line single into center field, holds on at first base. That's hit number six off Gomez. And up now steps Dick Bartell, who has one blow this afternoon. He dropped the fly ball single in the left field in the third inning, just ahead of Mel Ott, who had that home run in his system, which he finally got out. Lazari, crafty infielder. One of the brainiest players in the game. Comes up from second, has a brief conference with Gomez, talks to him a little bit, no doubt, about how to pitch to Bartell, a right-hand hitter. Moore leads off first. The pitch to the plate is swung on and fouled high and deep in back of third. Roth comes running over. Stewart right behind him, and it drops into the seats. In amongst the spectators, about three rows back. We'd like to comment upon the fine World Series that's been done by the umpires. We're very, very alert, running down the foul lines, running after plays, keeping up with the ball, on their toes and hustling all the way through. Both league presidents can be very proud of their arbiters. Uh, accidental foul, back into the giant dugout. An outside pitch, Bartell took that puzzling half swing, tried to check himself, couldn't get his bat out of the path of the projectile, and sliced it back foul. Now Dick's behind, nothing in two, no balls, two strikes, one out. Joe Moore on first base, a very fast runner, and the Yankees lead 4-2. Time is called, but Gomez throws anyhow, so disregard the pitch. 
Montel stepped out of the box. Umpire Ormsby of the American League back of the plate. Call time. Gomez not seeing the umpire's outstretched right palm through anyhow. So the pitch doesn't count. Still nothing in two. Bartell waiting. Takes high. Now it's one and two. One up above the bridge of Dick's nose. After he pulled a couple of steps around toward left. Presetti and Lazari make it up between them. Who's going to cover second? Should more come down? Gomez delivers to the plate. Bartell swings, drives the fly ball out into left center field. Demantio goes back, waves Roth out of the way and makes the catch. Uh, Hogue out of the way and makes the catch. That's all for Bartell. The thunderous applause, which is now echoing through the stand, is for Melvin Ott, who put a World Series crowd into its highest state of hysteria so far this fall when he walked up to the plate in the third inning with Bartell on first and hit that home run to put the Giants back on an even footing with the Yankees. And now Ott is coming up for his next appearance after that homer. Two men are off. Joe Moore is on first. The pitch to Ott. Outside. All one. Gomez apparently is not going to give out anything he can pull toward right field. Now field is toward right. The pitch is swung on and rolled down to second. Lazari picks it up cleanly. They'll throw over to Garrick. Ott is out. So ends the last of the fifth inning. And the score stands. The Yankees four runs and the Giants two. Here is Warren Brown. Gomez in that inning after getting away to a slightly bad start when Joe Moore got his base hit certainly pitched his way out of whatever trouble might have been coming up. Incidentally Joe Moore is apparently on his way to become the leading batsman of this 1937 World Series. So far he's batted successfully in each of the games that have been played to date. The right-handed pitchers are left-handed pitchers. Don't seem to make much difference to Joe, and most of his base hits have been very solid ones, line drives through or over the infield. Because of the fact that Blondie Ryan was used as a pinch hitter in that inning, the Giants will have to start another pitcher, and coming in from the bullpen now is a man who looks strangely like another left-hander, Al Smith, who will probably take up here. I would call your attention, too, to the fact that Melton in the other game he started, which was the second game of the World Series, went just about as far as he did today, although in his first game he was driven out, and in this game he was taken out for a pinch hitter. All right, Red, perhaps you want to describe some of the activities of Al Smith out there where he's digging in on that red clay mound preparatory to see what he can do to the Yankees. Thank you a great deal, Warren. Stocky little Al Smith, who has been used primarily as a relief pitcher his entire tenure with the Giants, is now throwing down to Harry Danny. Mellock, very cool, has come over from third and is standing on the third base edge of pitcher's mound watching Smith and talking to him as Smith is working out the last kinks in that left arm of his. And standing aside from batter's box and watching Smith also is George Selkirk, who will be first up in the sixth inning for the Yankees. He'll be followed by Lazare and then by pitcher Gomez. There's the last of the warm-up pitches, and it's thrown down to second base. Whitehead takes it, puts it over to Bartell, and Bartell walks it back to the mound, stands talking to Smith. Tell Kirk steps in, left-hand hitter. Melton has just gone out of sight, up into the clubhouse, finished for the afternoon. Now Bartell goes back to his post short. The outfield pulls around toward right. Bartell moves a couple of steps toward second. Right side of the infield as the steps are moved over toward right. Selkirk swings on the first pitch at the sharp line drive foul high up into the upper deck of the right field stand. Selkirk pulled that one a couple of feet too much. A solid smack. Going right after Al Smith, the relief pitcher for the Giants this afternoon after his first pitch. Now Selkirk back again. He's twisting the handle of the bat around Briggs in the palms of his hands to be certain that he has a firm hold on it. Smith, duly warned, now he's ready to pitch again to Selkirk, delivers. George takes a dip to do curve, low inside after almost going after it, ball one. One and one. Formsby is behind the plate this afternoon for the American League. Barr is at first, Basil at second, and Stewart is at third. The umpires, the same assignment this afternoon is for the first game of the series. This is the fifth game. 
Smith down out of his stretch, delivers a change of pace low outside, ball two, two and one. The Yankees are ahead, four to two. Smith steadies Danning sign a moment, down a swinging stretch, down, pitch misses outside, curve that did not stay on, three and one. Now takes a deep breath, pushes his lips out for the moment. Times called the Selkirk, steps out of the box. Now Twinkle toes in again. He's turned slightly toward right field. Right field to Ripple. Back as deep as the wall will commit. Selkirk takes a change of pace in there for call strike two. Not a slow ball, but Smith slowed down his curve. Selkirk off his timing. Did not go after it. After wriggling his shoulders at the pitch. Three and two. There's a ground ball rolled down by first. McCarthy up with it and beats Selkirk to the bag easily. Selkirk out by four steps. And it's one up and one away as we start the sixth inning. But Selkirk certainly uh, took a few years off of the giant rooters here at the Polo Grounds live. And he hits Smith's first pitch of the sixth inning, a whistling high drive that just was pulled foul. John Brennan is now throwing in the giant bullpen. The hitter up is Tony Lazari, who has one for two, a tremendous triple his last trip. And Lazari cannot get out of the way of an inside pitch that hits him on the left knee. Tony limps for about one step and then starts walking off down toward first. Shakes it off. He doesn't bother to lean over and rub it. That's the first hit batter in the series. Al Smith puts Lazari on first base. Hitting him on the left knee. Tony is walking around, working out that left knee, letting his uh, body weight go down on it gingerly. Tony walks off first. Gomez waiting. Gomez is very, very happy. He singled in the fifth inning and drove in a run. Hitting that handed. Once down toward third. I picked it up. He throw it to second base in time for a force on Lazari. The Yankee strategy was to have the pitcher butt, which Gomez did. And the oddity of it is that Gomez looked to be a much, much better butter than the rest of his Yankee teammates who are supposed to know how to do such tricks. Gomez pushing a butt right down toward third. Not suspicious of it. Came in on the pitch, picked it up, and threw down two seconds for a force on Lazari. Gomez with a sacrifice fielder's choice, which counts as an official trip to the plate, is now at first base. He has his sweater on. Very wet. The Yankees ahead by two runs, and the hitter is Crosetti. Setting right-handed. Takes a curve outside. Ball one. A few pulled a little around toward left. Martel's a step down toward third. Rosetti takes a curve that's neatly in. The count's even. One and one. Smith who relies mainly on his curved ball. He has curved at several speeds. But he's glad to show the boys any time they want a demonstration. Looks at first, not pitches. He misses that one. Low outside. It's two and one. Two balls, one strike. Yankees four, Giants two. This is the top of the six. Two of the Rupert Rifles have been fired as blanks. Gomez is the only base runner at the moment. Leading off first. Joe McCarthy holds the corner against him. Smith carefully pitches the position, delivers. Cresetti bounces slowly down toward third. Smith runs over, picks it up, throws back to first. In time by a half step. A slow, dying, top roller down toward third, which Smith himself could get to a step before Ott. And that step difference made the difference on the out at first base. And that's all for the top of the sixth. One. And that uh, red was one of the finest bits of feeling that the series has developed to date. There wasn't anything spectacular about it, but for all the elements that were required, and Smith getting over there towards the line after that hit, and keep from sliding in that sort of soggy ground, then ride himself, get the ball over to first base in time to keep Crosetti from getting an infield hit. All those things combined to make that quite a play. And at this point, I would say that this World Series of 1937 has certainly produced a lot of great plays. Every game has seen some splendid feeling things on the part of individuals on both sides. 
And right at this moment, although the Yankees are leading 4-2, to two, and the game is past the halfway mark, one never knows what might develop. The Giants are coming to bat now with the middle part of their batting order, preparing to face Lefty Gomez, and we shall see what we shall see. All right, Ben. First up in the last of the sixth inning, Ripple, Lever, McCarthy. Gomez has not finished throwing down his preliminary pitches to Bill Dickey's yet. He has one or two more left. Umpire Ormsby, standing in back of Dickey, holding his mask in his hand, is eyeing the procedure. Lazari is stationed patiently down at second base, waiting for the last of the pitches and the return to him by Dickey. There it is. Tony puts it down to short. Grisetti passes it on to Roth, the third baseman. Gomez following the flight of the balls. He's in position to take it as soon as Roth puts it over to him. Now stepping in is Ripple, who has one for two this afternoon. Hitting left-handed, he takes the fastball inside. All one. Outfield is toward right. One and nothing to Ripple. First up, last of the six. The Giants two runs behind. Gomez shoots it down. Ripple swings at the line drive over to Betty's head. Tapey out into left field. A whistling single. And Ripple with his second single is on first base, opening up the last of the sixth inning. A sharp single to left field. That's tip number seven for the Giants. And it's tip number 13 in the ball game. What will it mean? What will it lead to? Up now is big blonde Hank Lieber, right-hand hitter. The pitch is a curve, breaking sharply down in for a call strike. Gomez fixes his uniform a moment, licks the fingers quickly of his left hand. The infield is straight away. Upper half step around second. The outfield is straight away. Gary holds first against Ripple. Inside for ball one. One and one. One ball, one strike. Lieber, when it's looked big, powerful figure. Tap the heavy end of his bat down on the plate and straightens up. Gomez fires. Lieber swings at the foul back onto the netting. Straight back. One and two. Hanks behind. Hank, one of the few ball players in World Series history to have two hits in one inning. Those are his two hits with the series, and he got them both. The Giants beginning yesterday. Gomez pitches. Lieber swings as a foul. Hit down onto the plate and full foul on the ground and back of third. Schneider, the Giants third base coach, picks it up. Outfield still remains straight away. Gomez ready to go. Delivers. Lieber swings as a hit into left center field. Second goes Ripple, and when the ball is momentarily fumbled by DiMaggio, he heads to third, and then when Joe picks it up, he ducks right back to second. That was one of these, I go this way, I go that way, and finally I stay where I am. Ripple advances to second, as Lieber hits a solid single out into left center field. DiMaggio picking it up, fumbled it momentarily, and Ripple started for third, and then when he saw Joe recovering, he immediately held on. And McCarthy has two pitches. In the bullpen, throwing hurriedly. They look from this distance to be Murphy and Wicker. Nobody out. The Giants have the tying runs on in the last of the sixth inning. And the hitter is Jack McCarthy. The Yankee infield is pulled up looking for a butt. There it is. And it's foul down along the third baseline. McCarthy trying to sacrifice the two giant runners from first and second to second and third to put them both in position to be scored on a base hit. That's the strategy at the moment, or was the strategy on that last pitch. Schneider, the third base coach, called Ripple to run down to third while the Yankees are having a confab around pitcher's mound. Ripple comes down and Schneider tells him personally. Evidently, he's not going to trust the signs on what this next move is to be. The tying runs are on for the Giants, the underdogs, to a game lead, battling back. The Yankees lead, 4-2, to two. this is the last of the six, nobody out and with singles, Ripple is on second and Lieber on first, the pitch to McCarthy, is fighting this one toward the pitcher, Gomez fields it, throws over to third in time for a fourth, that's third, that's the only play, Gomez handling McCarthy's bunt, which was fighted straight back down the middle. Throwing it over to Red Roth. 
for a force by two steps on Ripple, who was coming down from second. So you have to score McCarthy as a sacrifice fielder's choice. Advance Lieber on the play down to second base and have Ripple force that third. Gomez two off. The tying runs are still on, but now one man is out. Let's see how the Yankees play for this. They're pulling their infield back straight away, evidently playing for a double play. The hitter is Danning. That's right-handed. Gomez delivers. Danning swings and misses. And he went after that one like a hungry man after food when he hasn't tasted it in three days. Strike one. Danning, after swinging on that pitch and missing it, asks umpire Osby to examine it, which the umpire gladly does, and finds the ball well qualified to remain in play. Lieber leading off second. Coffee off first. Danning swings. It's a high foul back into the second deck of the stands. Nothing in two. Gomez has now jumped ahead with his first two pitches on Harry Danning. Danning going up to both of them. Danning is punishing a big wad of gum. Chewing steadily, methodically. Gomez out of position. Delivers Danning. Swings and misses. Strike three. Gomez bore down and with three pitches executed Danning to accomplish his sixth striking B of the afternoon. The outfield, after being straight away on Danning, now shifts sharply toward right, despite the fact that Whitehead is a right-hand hitter. They don't claim to pull. Bridges Whitehead takes a strike. Gomez sneaking a wicked curve down in there. Gomez bearing down Brunningham now in this clutch here in the last of the sixth. Delivers. There's the ground ball rolled down to a second base from Rosario, who's up with it, plays over to Garrick. That's Hall for Burgess Whitehead. And so ends the giant threat of getting back on an equal plane with the Yankees in the ball game. And at the end of six innings, the Yankees are still ahead by their two runs, four to two. Warren. The Yankees are still ahead, but uh, rather because of some of the most effective pitching in the pinch by Gomez that the series has produced as yet. Those two runners on base and no one out certainly looked as if the Giants were going to go somewhere so that when he had to, Gomez certainly came in there with some fine pitching in that inning as he did in his first game. And uh, that is one of the reasons, I suppose, why it is that up to the present time, Gomez has never been defeated in a World Series ball game. He's doing all right today, too. All right, Ed. Thank Warren. And now to start the seventh inning with the Yankees coming to bat against relief pitcher Al Smith. Red Roth is the first hitter. DiMaggio and Gehrig in line. Roth getting left hand in the crouch. The Giants pull to the right. Red takes a strike. Smith puts the curve right down and over. Creasing that plate. Strike one calls. Al takes the sign from Danning. Harry comes out of his crouch. Then sets his middle to target. Roth swings. Trickles it down towards third. Ott picks it up. The throw to first. It's going to be close. It's in time by a half step. Roth is out. He hit that one apparently off the end of his bat. Rolled it down for third. One up and one away for the Yankees, starting the seventh. The little left-hander, who's leaving, Al Smith. He came on to start the sixth inning after starting pitcher Melton gave way for a pinch hitter. He's now ready to pitch to DiMaggio. Joe takes a strike. That was a fastball just above the knees. Just a half an inch above the knees. Strike one call. DiMaggio has one for three this afternoon, and what a blow that one was. A home run. The outfield toward left, indeed. Joe swings and misses. So that home run was still firmly implanted in his mind's eye. As though that were the stars from which to hitch his wagon. Now Smith ahead. Nothing in two. One out. Nobody on the seventh. Over his head and down. It's low. Danning tries to block it, but it bounds away from him. Doesn't make any difference. Nobody's on. Ball one. One and two. The manager picks up a little of the moist clay. Rubs it into the palms of his hand. Now gets a hold of the bat. Bounces it down two or three times on the plate. Straightens up. Then aside from one pump, stands like an automaton. Very part with that bat cock high behind his right ear. Swings, fouls it down onto the plate and up against him. Count remains, one and two. Ball still in play. Danning going out, picking it up. Going down to Ott, who puts it quickly over to Al Smith. John 
Brennan, throwing in the giant bullpen. Nobody working in the Yankee one. Smith pitching. Right through swinging, a low curve ball on the outside, and DiMaggio is whipped. That's the first strikeout for Al Smith, and it's the sixth Yankee to be fanned this afternoon. All told, there have been 12 strikeouts so far in this fifth World Series ball game of 1937, in which the Yankees are leading 4-2. to two. Here is Lou Gehrig, who hammered a double his last time up in that Yankee fifth when they went ahead. Gehrig getting left-handed, takes a strike. I believe that's the fastest ball that Smith has thrown. He whipped it down on the inside, just under the waistline. The outfield sharp toward right and deep. Big powerhouse hitter waiting. Takes outside. That one didn't stay on. One and one. Combs behind first. Fletcher behind third. Both talking it up. Yelling encouragement to Gehrig. Who stands there quietly, almost spottedly. He's ready. Swing. There's a line drive deep out of the right. Ripper coming in. Can't get it. Trips the ball. Bounds over his head. Goes back against the wall. Gehrig is around first. There he goes for second into the bullpen. Goes Leva. Picks it up. Gehrig is coming toward third. Whitehead goes out and takes the throw in. And Gehrig holds up that third base with a triple. It has to be scored as a triple. Gehrig hit a tremendously fast-traveling low-line drive straight out into right field. Ripple came running in and then saw he could not possibly catch it, and so he tried to check himself to take it easily on the first bow without having to play the ball trap. But, as you know, the polo ground is very, very wet after an all-night and a partially morning rain. And when Ripple tried to put the brakes on... Well, the spikes weren't long enough. His feet went out from under him. He fell flat upon his back, and Gehrig's ball bounced squarely over him. Went up against the wall, down into the giant bullpen, and it was up to Lieber to retrieve it. A triple for Gehrig here in the seventh with two out. And now the batter is Bill Dickey, hitting left-handed. Bill tries to push a butt, and it goes foul down toward third base. So Gomez is fair butt of the sixth inning, even if it did not accomplish its desired result, becomes more and more momentous. Luke Gehrig with a sharp triple, leading down off third. Dickey up there, one strike against him. That's the first hit off Al Smith, and it's the seventh hit for the Yankees this afternoon. The Giants have eight blows. Dickey waiting, hasn't hit today, swings, there's a high fly ball, belted deep in the center, Lieber is back, waiting, and he has it. That's all for the third of the top of the seventh. No run. One hit. And it's still 4-2 to the Yankees with the Giants coming in for what they hope will be their half of the lucky seventh. And here's more than half of the mic, Warren Brown. Thank you, Red. Well, it doesn't seem as though we can have a single half inning in this ball game without getting some manner of a thrill. That was one of the high points of the game, certainly, that ball that Gehrig lined out there into right field. And the Giants, after all sorts of difficulties out there, really did do some remarkable work in holding that to three bases. Perhaps uh, Gehrig might have kept on coming and uh, given us a little more excitement down here in front of us at the home plate. But Hank Lieber got over there in the bullpen after Jimmy Ripple was taken out of the play by falling down. The excitement contingent upon the racing of Lieber into the bullpen and the racing of Gehrig around the bases with the possibility at first of a home run inside of the grounds certainly had everybody up and yelling around here. The uh, pitching of Smith has been really effective. He's been in there for two innings now and outside of that ball which Gehrig landed on him. He hasn't been hit hard at all. That was the only base hit and most of the others that got it against him failed to hit solidly. We're having a pinch hitter now for the Giants as they come to bat in their half and I'll turn the microphone back to Red Barber. Batting instead of Al Smith, the relief pitcher who took Melton's place is Gus Mancuso, who has a broken right little finger, but he's hitting nevertheless. He takes high outside, and it's ball one to swat the little giant captain, Mancuso, who split the first bone in his right little finger. Gus takes a strike. Gomez coming right in there with it. One and one. Gus batting right-handed. Cuso sets, goes down in a crouch, takes outside. Fastball that did not break down and in. Two and one. 
First shot up in the last of the seven. The outfield is straight away on Mancuso. The infield playing straight away also. Roth is perhaps just a little wide at third. But he seems to play third a little wider than most third basemen anyhow. Gomez comes down with that left arm. Outside and high for ball three. Three and one to Mancuso, who has yet to offer. Just has just a slight bandage over the end of his right little finger. If it didn't look very closely, you wouldn't detect it. Gus has been soaking that finger. It seems like for 24 hours every day in grinding water trying to get the swelling down. Gus takes strike two. That ball is poured right through. Three and two. Mancuso, pinch hitting, starting off the last of the seven. Pitch 3-2 is swung on. It's a high fly ball into right center. Zucker, Gundred, and has it. Pinch hitter Mancuso is out. Now it's one away. Starting the Giants half of the seventh, the last of the seventh. The ball game stands at 4-2 to two in favor of the American Leaguers. The top of the order, Joe Moore who has eight hits in this series out of 21 trips. He has the most hits of any ball player on either side of the fence. Betting left-handed, takes inside. One that caused him to lean back, but did not break down over the plate. Ball one. Moore has two singles out of three tries today. So she sticks somewhat. Swings and misses. Going for one in there on the fingers. One and one. Luque, one of the greatest of the Cuban ball players in the major leagues. The Giants coach at first, Snyder behind third. Moore takes inside, getting back from it to ball two. Two and one. That field of Hogue is straight away. Center field of DiMaggio is about four steps over toward right center. And Selkirk is straight away in right. Moore swings, and it's a line drive to right center field, which is in there for a hit. Joe's third of this ball game this afternoon. His third blow, this one going out into left center field. And that gives Moore three for four today and gives him nine hits out of 22 tries. Now there seems to be an electric wave of excitement surging through the polo grounds as the spectators more or less edge out from the far end of their seats to feel that something might be ready to pop or happen. Dick Bartell's up there, betting right-handed. Swings and fouls back into the stands. The upper deck behind home. Strike one. It's a four to two ball game at the moment in favor of the Yankees. With one out in the last of the seventh. Joe Moore is on first base for the Giants. Gary holds the corner. The pitch to Bartell is swung on, lifted high and short. In back of shortstop, Crisetti under it, and he has it. Then he drops it deliberately and throws over to second baseman, Lazari. And so the out is on Moore, who is thereby forced at second base. And Bartell is at first. The infield fly rule does not come up on that situation. What happens is this. Crosetti deliberately dropped that pop by Bartell. The idea was, because it was such an easy-looking play from the start, Crosetti hoped that Bartell would not be running it out. And thereby, if he was not... They might have gotten a double play. As it is, Moore is forced to second base, short to second, and ball tails the runner at first. The first pitch to Mel out, low outside for ball one. And now the stage is set in the seventh, as it was in the third, except for one difference. One was out in the third, now two are out in the seventh. Out it takes ball two. One thrown at the point of his shoulder, which drives him down to a knee, getting out of the way, and it's two nothing. Out is at the plate. Martell is at first base. And the Giants are two runs behind. Out remedied that in the third. Can he do it in the seventh? He takes high inside under the chin. Ball three. And it's three nothing. To Mellon. The pitch is inside for ball four. Gomez gives up his first pass of the ball game. Walking Mellon to put the tying run at first base. Bartell strolls on down to second. Bartell at second, out at first, and Jimmy Ruffle is the hitter. He has two for three this afternoon. He has five blows out of 16 tries in the series. Ruffle stands at the plate, a sturdy left-hand swinger. Gomez delivers, outside for ball one. A 
Bobby has two of his right-handers warming up in his bullpen now for the Yankees. Gomez delivers. Ripple takes inside against him. Four ball two. And Gomez is having difficulty with his control. He has not thrown a strike on any of his last six tries. Out at first, the tying run. Martell at second. Two out in the last of the seven. The pitch now, two nothing. He's taken four ball three. Up against Ripple. And it's three and all to Jimmy Ripple. One more pitch that will be wide. And the bases will be filled. The tying run pushed down two seconds. However, there will be a deliberation before this fourth pitch to Ripple. Lou Gehrig, the captain, comes walking down and talks to catcher Bill Dickey. Rainey second baseman Lazari comes over to the mound along with third baseman Red Rolf to talk to pitcher Gomez. Now Gehrig goes down toward first. Gomez steps back on the pitcher's plate. Lazari goes walking back to second. Rossetti takes his depth at short. Rolf his position on third. It's 3 0 to Ripple. The pitch. Strike one call. Right in there. Gomez had no choice but to try and throw a straight one, straight as a string, two as a die. That it was. Now field toward right. Three and one. Will Ripple hit this one? Let's see. He takes it. It's all strike two. Three and two. Gomez takes a look out to the bullpen. As if to say, well, I'm glad to know you guys are out there, but I hope I don't need you. Now the pitch is the runner's break is swung on. It's down to Larry, who's up with it over to first. That's all for Ripple. And so ends the threat in the last of the seventh inning. And the ball game stands at the end of seven hectic fiddle rounds. Four for the American League Yankees and two for the National League Giants. We pause for station identification. WMAQ, Chicago. Back in the NBC booth in the Polo Grounds, where the New York Yankees and Giants are engaged in their World Series game. The Yankees leading at the present time 4-2. to two. The Giants just having missed another opportunity in their half of the seventh of getting someplace and getting the score tied. Once again, as in the sixth inning, the Giants had two men on bases, and uh, that was the way the inning ended, with the two men still on bases. The necessary hit was not forthcoming. Jimmy Ripple, who was up there in the pinch, hit the ball hard, but directly at Tony Lazari, and thus Vernon Gomez in these last two innings, having given, given the Giants opportunities to get the score squared, certainly clamped down on them when it really began to get serious. However, these two innings have provided the rather large crowd for a rather chilly afternoon here at the Polo Grounds a little bit more excitement to add to what has been created ever since the game started. This is far and away the most interesting game of the entire series, and that interest has been sustained from start right to the present time. We're going into the eighth inning now, and Red Barber, it's your turn. Thank you, Warren. And it's now Don Brennan's turn out there on the round to make his second relief appearance in this World Series. Brennan, who spent most of his years in baseball as property of the Yankees, and now with the Giants, gets his first chance to pitch against the Yankees. Brennan is ready to pitch to hold first up in the eighth inning. The Yankees lead 4-2. to two. Right-hander Brennan delivers. His curveball is outside. Ball one. Don pitched the ninth inning Friday and set down Dickie Selkirk and Hogan order. He's ready for his second pitch now to hold. He's in the crouch, hitting right-handed. Hold swings and misses. Above it for strike one. One and one. Brennan very cool. Very smart. He has a great deal of stuff. He relies on his control and on his knowledge of hitter's weaknesses. He delivers. It's a fastball in there. Strike two. One and two. The hold first up in the eighth. The hold this afternoon has one blow out of three tries. That was a home run. First up in the second inning. It was the first score of the afternoon. Don delivers. A curve which is swung on. Lifted deep out of the left. Joe Moore is going back, 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 back. And leaning against the wall, he makes the catch. Right against the 414-foot distance sign. Joe Moore, 414 feet away from home plate, leaned way back up against the boards and made the catch. That's all for hold. And the fielding plays, far excellent, continue apace. And I believe we are approaching even higher hysterical height in this World Series ball game, the fifth. 
1937. Now it's one out in the top of the eighth, and the batter is Selkirk, hitting left-handed. He hasn't hit this afternoon out of three tries. He failed to get a hit yesterday. George batting left-handed, proud of the plate from behind. Selkirk swinging, the line drives it out into right field, Ruffles stays on his feet this time, chops it, the throws into second, and Selkirk with a single, holds up at first base. Single in the right for George Selkirk. That is hit number eight for the Yankees this afternoon. The man in is Tony Lazari, who hit a tremendous better than 450 foot on the fly triple in the fifth inning. You know, this is a ballpark that is 25 straight through the middle. Lazari hitting right handed, choking that stick drastically. The outfield is straight away, infield up around second. Strike one call. Right in, above the knees. One out. Selkirk on first. McCarthy holds the corner. Don takes the sign. And that's for it again. Not any show of emotion. He gets ready down in the pitcher's position. Delivers outside as the pitch out, but there's no throw to first. As McCarthy was not back on the bag. And in fact, Selkirk was closer to first base than McCarthy. One and one to Lazari. Four to two, favor of the Yankees over the Giants. A curve just misses the outside corner, not holding on. Lazari goes ahead on the count, two and one. Melot is playing back fairly deep at third and a little bit over to the line. A throw to first by Brennan, holding Selkirk on. Bartell spoke to Whitehead, the rest of the keystone combination for the Giants. Behind the back of his glove, he does it again now. Killing Whitehead, who's going to cover second? Should Selkirk come down? A high fly ball into short left field. Joe Moore is on his mule, coming in fast, but it shorts up Bartell back for the catch. Rosari hits sky high up into the clearing clouds of the afternoon. The threat of rain, which came up at the start of the fifth inning, when a few misty drops fell, appears to have been vanished. No one is thinking of rain any longer. Now two out in the eighth. The hitter will be Gomez. There he is, coming up to the plate. That's left-handed. He's south ish all the way through. Danning goes out to talk to Brennan. They're standing a third of the way out in front of home plate. Talking for the moment. Gomez stands quietly, leaning on his bat, so it were a prop. Manning judges back of home plate. Brennan sets out there on the mound. Selkirk ready to go on anything. Two out, leads way down off first. The outfield is pulled toward right and in close. Gomez crotches, takes inside. The knees for ball one. Gomez has a hit. If he can win this ball game, there'll be no holding him tonight. If he can also win a game pitching and get a base hit to boot, one that drives in a run. Gomez swing. There's a low line drive into left. Moore waiting for it. Takes it. Gomez is out. But it's that. He smoked that apple right pertly on the nose. Well, that's all for the top of the eighth inning. And as we get ready to go into the last of the eighth with the Giants coming in, the Yankees still lead 4-2. to two. Warren. Red, if uh, it is true, as it seems to be in the last couple of innings, that Gomez is letting down a little as a pitcher off of his previous effectiveness, he's certainly picking up in his hitting. You've mentioned, and uh, Tom Manning ahead of you mentioned, the fact that Gomez drove in the run, which put his ball club ahead in this 1937 World Series. And now to find him coming up there, hitting at another type of pitching, Don Brennan's type, and lashing that line fly out into left field, he's beginning to look a little bit like Ty Cobb. And as you said very truly, there will be no holding him because any pitcher likes to win his game when he's pitching, but no pitcher likes anything better than a base hit. And you said a mouthful, if I may use that expression, when you said that about Gomez. Well, here are the Giants with Hank Lieber taking another try at it in their half of the eighth. All right, here. Hank Lieber, with McCarthy on deck and Danning in the hole. Lieber has one for three this afternoon. He has three hits out of ten tries in the series. The score is four to two. Favor the Yankees. The Giants are not only two runs behind in the ball game, but they're two runs behind in the World Series. Out field straight away and deep on Hank, who takes strike one. Gomez getting the jump for the first pitch. Call strike on the inside, right under the belt buckle. 
Mabel, a big powerhouse, stands at the plate waiting. Gomez delivers. Bad ball inside. Missing by a finger. It's one and one. DiMaggio now moves over about a step, step and a half over toward left. The pitch comes in, swung on, and foul tips straight back on the line. One and two. He was behind. One ball, two strikes. First giant up in the last of the eighth. Gomez drives up the fingers of his left hand. Leans down, takes the sign. Cusetti, talking it up and short. Now the pitch. Low and into the dirt. Dickey traps it, has a little difficulty holding on to it, has to chase it back of him a couple of feet. Hornsby, asks for the ball, looks at it. Allows it to remain in play. Not scarred or roughened to great an extent. Two and two to Hank Lieber, the first giant up in the last of the eighth. Giants trailing by two runs. Gomez delivers. Lieber swings, and it's a base hit through the hole between third and short out into left field. And Lieber holds on at first base with a single. His second straight hit this afternoon, giving him two for four. A single in the left, which was hit sharply between Roth and Prophetic. That's hit number nine off Gomez. Stepping up now is young Jack McCarthy. Slender left-hand hitter. He's finishing out his first year in the big show. He was a rookie with the Giants in the pennant race. Gomez pitches. Outside, ball one. Johnny Murphy going out in the bullpen now for the Yankees. Gomez pitches. Swung on and missed. Swinging strike under the shoulder. One and one to McCarthy. Standing's on deck, bringing a couple of war clubs. Make one feel lighter. The pitch is under the chin for ball two. Bobby had to bend backwards like a reverse jackknife. Keep from getting a closer shave than he would like. That is, in a ball game. Gomez looks at first, now delivers. McCarthy swing. It's a long fly ball. Deep out of the right. Chuck Kirk is back. Scores and takes it. And Lieber, a third of the way down towards second. Trots back on the first base as the throw in comes to second baseman Lozari. That's all for McCarthy. One away in the last of the eighth. Right now is Danny. Harry had three for four yesterday. So far, he's 0 for three today. And twice, Gomez has struck him out. The other time he got him out, he made him foul up to catch a Bill Dickey. Danning up. I feel straight away. Lieber leading off first. Danning swinging. Foul tips it straight back into the netting. Strike one. Dickey takes a new ball, wraps it right back out to Gomez. The very live... Loose jointed left hander. Gets the sign. Licks his fingers. Now set. Facing first. And time is called. Gomez stops the pitch and then has to hold up. Danning walking back out of the box. Someone out in the bleachers, apparently. Oh, I see what it is. A salesman for something, one of the park salesmen for the concession, in a white suit, was walking up the steps in the bleachers, right on a line with Danning's eye and the pitcher. So time had to be called until the rusher got out of the way. Now the pitcher's high and outside. One and one to Danning. A batter focusing his eye on the pitcher, trying to watch the ball in the pitcher's hand. If something uh, white distracts him out in the bleachers, it can be serious. There is a line drive right to Gary, who steps on first base, jumping leave along. Danning swung on an outside pitch, tried to hit it to right field, and hit it about a yard fair inside of first, right at Gary, who smothered it with his mitt, made one leap like a frightened kangaroo, bounding on the first base for an unassisted double play by Gary. And that ends the last of the eighth inning. And the Yankees are still persevering along ahead, four to two, Mr. Brown. And Red, that also ends another trying inning for the New York Giants for the third time in a row. Now they look as though they were getting ready to start something, but nothing has happened. That last one was really a tough break because Danning, who had a chance to drive in a run two innings ago and didn't really start it out that time as though he was going to do some damage. That line drive he hit was well hit, but unfortunately for the Giants' cause, directly at Gary, who was very close to first base and had no trouble making double play. 
That's three innings in a row now that Gomez has started the Giants off and raised some of their hopes, undoubtedly, and then had them dashed to earth, a rather soggy earth at the polo grounds this afternoon. Now the Yankees are coming to bat for the first half of the ninth inning and what may possibly be for their last time in the 1937 World Series. Certainly it will be unless when the Giants get around to it, they get some runs. All right, then. Off tonight, right hand hitting Cresetti is up, takes low under the knees, runs first pitch of the ninth inning, ball one. The outfield slightly around toward left, the infield is straight away, right hand up a step by second. Runner comes down with his right arm, the pitch is inside, up against Cresetti's letters, and it's ball two, do nothing. Mikey Cresetti, who has just one hit in the series. For his 22nd time. Takes low inside for a ball three. One just above the toes of his shoes. New ball put in play. Up down at third, takes it from Danning. Rubs it up, walks it over to the mound. Running behind now. Three and oh. Presetti set. Little right hand hit on the crowd, choking his stick. John delivers. It's low for ball four, and go ahead to present walks the first Yankee up in the ninth inning. The runner is Red Rawls, who has one hit out of three official tries today. He's been on the bases twice as he drew a pass in the fifth inning. Outfield pulls around toward right. They play Rolf as a full hitter. Runner watching first, now delivers. Rolf front. The ball bounds down and up and hits him. It is foul. Strike one. The Giants come in. Starting to say, there yeah, the basis of the giant argument is that the ball, when it bounded up and hit, Rolf was in fair territory, and therefore the batter should be automatically out. However, umpire Orsby rules that the attempted butt was foul all the way, and it hit Rolf as a foul ball, and therefore is just foul ball strike one. That's nothing in one. Danning walking out toward the mound. Brennan, after taking the ball from him on a short toss, was trudging back up to that summit of red clay that is Pitcher's Hill here in the polo grounds. Nobody out. Presetti leading down off first. Carthy holds the corner. Whitehead is halfway down. The Giants are looking for a butt. Ralph tries to butt. This one is fair. Danning takes it. Throws down to first. Ralph is out. Presetti safely sacrificed down to second base. The Yankees in the ninth inning of this fifth game accomplish a sacrifice play. Something the Giants in the first one or two games wish they had done. Instead of swinging with two strikes on them after two foul bumps. Presetti, sacrifice down to second. The out was Danning to McCock. Out one away. Here in the top of the ninth, DiMaggio is up there. Running off, set the pitch to him. John delivers. Inside. Curve, which started at the shoulder. Broke down toward the plate, but didn't break enough. Ball one. Presetti leading off the Keystone, 180 feet from where they pay off. That field, a step toward left and deep. Dimaggio waits, takes high outside, ball two. Runners behind, two nothing. Don Brennan, the third giant pitcher out this afternoon. Melton started, pitched five innings, gave way for a hitter. All four of the Yankee runs he came off cliff. Smith pitched the next two, Brennan pitched one, and he's now going into the ninth. A curve is hit high and short out into left field. Under it is shortstop Bartell and has it. For the second out at the top of the ninth. DiMaggio popping sky high up and out. Threw away in the ninth. The Yankees ahead. Four to two. Lou Gehrig steps into the plate. Blue has a double and a triple for his last two efforts. He has five hits all told in the series. His bag includes a grand slam. Not put together in any one game. But throughout the series, he has one of every kind. A single, a double, triple, and a home run. That's what you'd call pretty fair country clout. Where I came from. Two away, top of the ninth. Presetti at second. Lou Gehrig up. He hasn't been stopped. The last two tries. Hitting left-handed, takes outside. Brennan's pitch did not come down on him there. Right-handed pitcher working to a left-hand hitter. 
Ball one. Pichetti ready to go on anything. Running carefully down in the pitcher's position, delivers. A curve in there, and there's a throw to second, which is into the dirt, but Bartell comes up with it. Pichetti, of course, is back long ago safely. A call strike to Gary, with Danning threw down toward second and threw it into the dirt, about six feet short of second base and a couple of feet on the shortstop side of the keystone. Bartell took it on the hop, did not allow it to go through. Running into position, throwing out of the shoulder. A curve down in the ball strike two. Gehrig took a long, healthy stride going in on that pitch, but did not swing. And it broke sharply down in there. One and two to lose. Running again in position, delivering. Gehrig swings and misses. Strike three. And so ended the top of the ninth inning. And the Giants will now be pressing in for what may be their last chance. Warren Brown. And even that inning could not get by without something, some little bit added to the excitement. The potential run on second base. And DiMaggio, Gehrig, and Dickey supposedly coming up next. That was a trying moment for Don Brennan. I thought he did real well in getting out of there without any damage. He limited DiMaggio to a high fly just a little bit back on the grass. And, of course, striking out Gehrig is always something to get excited about at the time. Now the Giants will be at bat for their last time unless they happen to get themselves two runs. And if they get more than two runs, it will still be their last time. Since it is the last half of the ninth inning, the home club's half, and I imagine that the official attendance of 38,216 would sort of like to see the game get tied up and go on. After all, it's getting to be a much better day now than when it started. And everyone present, with the exception of the Yankee folks, of course, are pulling for a tie score. Here they go, Red. Burgess Whitehead is first up Gomez pitches. Strike one called. The first pitch of the last of the ninth. And with what feelings? Last of the ninth is approached by both clubs. The pitch swung on and fouled back. Strike two. Nothing in two to Whitehead. This afternoon, Whitehead has one for three, a double. He has four hits out of 15 tries in the series. The outfield is playing in, notably in center and right, and is pulled toward right. Left side of the infield is up a step. The right side is usual depth. Right in the crowd swinging. It's a clouding fly out in the center. DiMaggio lopes back and pulls it down for the out. And the Giants, two runs behind, have but two outs left to them in the ball game and in the series. One away on the last of the ninth inning. And Wally Berger is coming up to bat for Don Brennan. Wally Berger, big right-handed hitter. Wally Berger up there. Takes high outside. All right. This is the third time in the series Berger has come up as a pinch hitter. He has not delivered. Pitch is high outside for ball two. Berger is ahead. Berger, who when he connects, has terrific driving power. With these fans yawning dangerously close down along each foul line, Berger sets. Gomez left-handed in. Berger swings, breaks his bat, hits it into the dirt in front of Vazari, who's up with it to throw to first. Berger is out. And that's what you call insult to injury. Breaking a bat and then going out at the same time. And now but one out remains to the National League cause. The Giants being their standard ballers in this 1937 And now Bill Terry, the manager of the Giants, and injured catcher and captain Gus Mancuso have come out. Berger has come back to join them, and they are putting on an argument with umpire Ormsby. The argument, no doubt, being whether there was interference on Berger's swing that time with his bat. That's the second time... That argument about interference by the catcher with the batter's bat has come up this afternoon. And for the first time in the series, we have a conference of the four wells of the Blue Surge. Umpire Ormsby calls his three compatriots, his fellow American League umpire Basil and the National League arbiters Barn Stewart for a confab. And they talk it over, and they agree there was not interference. The four umpires decided that. And Terry, 
takes off his cap, and in mock deference to the umpires, bows scrapingly low, and you can see him just work if he says, I thank you. Now the umpires go back to their stands between the Yankees and the championship of the world in 1937. But one out is left to the giant cause. Ball swing, a slow roller down toward first. Gary picks it up, the throw is over to Gomez, who covers. That's the final out. Gomez makes the final put out himself. Gary to the pitcher. Moore is out, and the hilariously happy Yankees are making a mad dash for their clubhouse with the giant coming back. And the... Yankees are now champions of the world, and now the National Broadcasting Company takes you to Tom Manning in the Yankee Clubhouse. All right, ladies and gentlemen, and here's the boy that hit the longest ball of the series, Joe DiMaggio. Thanks, Tom. Joe. Thanks, Tom. It was a great thrill to win this game. I mean, that home run was great, too. Hey, Luke, I never hit a ball a lot of my life. The Giants played a good game, and we did, too. I mean, as far as... I was concerned, it was a great game. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. And here's... Where's that Jerry guy? Hey, George Selker, come here. Yeah. Hey, you are, George. What do you want me to say now? How do you feel, boy? Oh, just fine. And hey, George Selker, come here's the guy that picked the two winning goal games. Come on over here, Lefty. Lefty oh, Gomez. I'm really thrilled to death, and I want to say to my folks out in California, I'll be home real soon. Thank you very much, Tom. What are you puffing about? I'm happy. And just run in from the field, oh, come on, you know? give us a gag. It wouldn't be Lefty Gomez without some kind of a gag. Come here, Bill. The well, I do like that hit I got today, Tom. I think that was a pippa. Listen, what you have on there? Everything? Nothing. I was very lucky. All right, and here's his catcher, Phil Dickey, one of the greatest hey, catchers ever lived. Hello, Phil. Give Gomez all the credit, boy. He deserves these last, this last ball game and that first one, too. He pitched great ball all during the series. He's a great pitcher. What do you have out there today, Bill? Plenty. He had a lot of everything. Bill, you hit that old ball pretty hard, but you were hitting it too far and too high, kid. Yeah, well, you got to be lucky. What are you going to do this winter? Well, I'm going down to Florida on a vacation right now. What are you going to do with that dough? Oh. <laughs> Lefty, what are you going to do with that dough? Lefty Gomez. Going to put it into an annuity for my, when I'm an old man. Oh old man. You're an old man now. What do you mean when you're an old man? All right, the photographers have pushed him out. Here's Joe McCarthy, ladies and gentlemen, the greatest manager that ever lived. Oh. One of the finest fellas I was radio and newspaper men. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to present to you now Joe McCarthy, the manager of the world champion, New York Yankees. Well, I'm very happy, but... Uh, I really thought that the Giants would give us a little tougher battle. I really thought they'd at least win two of the... And I'll win. I just run through the field. <laughs> what, what's the matter, Joe? I'm so tickled. I don't know. I couldn't say anything anyhow. I'm going to say hello to the folks over in Buffalo. Well, I want to say hello to all my good friends in Buffalo, and I'll soon be back with you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, a lot. Come on over here. Ark Fletcher, come here. Ark Fletcher. Well, I want to first say hello to everybody in Collinsville, Illinois. I want to thank Henry Sherman for the wonderful telegram, and I say we're all in there's a wonderful demonstration going on. I'm going to let somebody else talk. Pat Malone, come on over. Thanks a lot. That was a great series. In my room, he pitched a great game. I'm Gomez and Roman. Oh, Violin and Mother and Joe. It was the greatest series of believe I ever saw. What are you going to do with that big fat check? Same as last year. Give it to our wife and baby. Hi, Al Tina. Tony, come on over. Oh. Lazari. Tony, come here. Tony. Hey, Hello, everybody in San Francisco and Millbury. It's been a wonderful series. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of the American League, the Honorable Lou Harris. Too much noise here, but I want to just say a great victory for the American League. Thank you very much, President Harris. Red Rolf, come here. Don't you run away. You've got to get over here. We redheads will stick together again. Ah, it's great to be on another winner. We all knew that Lefty Gomez would stop him today and finish. Thank you very, very much, Red. You played a lot of third base, too. Listen, I want to get a hold of Lou Jerry. Where's Lou? Where's Jerry? Well, now he's sitting over here with his arms around to Joe DiMaggio. Can you get off that court for a moment? Please, will you give us a little more court? Hey, photographer. Hey, photographer, off the court, please. Where is that? Lou, come on up here. I've got enough court. Come on over here. Come on over here, little Shell, New York. Oh, don't be so bad. I mean, I'm, I'm just lucky to be with a great ball club. That's all. Listen, what do we have on that ball that you hit that? Come on over here. Say hello to that wife of yours, you big step. Come on. Come on, Lou. Oh, there's a quartet, and uh, what have you, they're taking pictures up there. And that quartet happens to be Earl Combs, the tenor, and so forth. And ladies and gentlemen, Bedlam has broken loose. We've had the pleasure of having our NBC microphone uh, here in the uh, dressing room. The boys are being pushed and shoved around. I do want to get uh, Colonel Rupert on the air for you. If I can really include that, would you please say? Colonel Rupert. And here's the owner of the Yankees. Hey, hey, give me the cord, please. Colonel Rupert. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Rupert is perhaps the happiest man here, and I know that 
He'd like to speak to you all over the world. And here he is, the Honorable Colonel Rupert Owner of the New York Yankees of the American League. Colonel Rupert. No doubt. I'm the happiest man in the world. The club did great work and deserves to win it. They're a fine ball club and a fine bunch of fellas, and they deserve it. Thank you all. Thank you, Colonel Rupert. Hey, Charlie Ruffy. Charlie. Hey, Charlie. Get Ruffy. Go ahead. Here. Tom Henry. Here's the boy that caused a lot of excitement throughout the year, Tom Henry. Uh, he was made a free agent, got himself about 25 grand, and he's from Ohio, the same state that I am from, a smiling youngster on his first world championship team, Tom Henry. Great to be on this team. That's my land. I'm too darn hoarse to say much. I didn't get in the game, but I sure howled like a son of a buck. You'll be in there a lot, kid. Don't worry about that. And here's the old red roughing himself, ladies and gentlemen. What a ball game he played. How are you, kid? Oh, fine, Rad. Right? I'm glad it's all over, and I didn't think the best team won. No, two. Say, so you're pretty happy about getting that dough that you lost early in the spring after you held out, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah. What are you going to do with all that dough? Oh, it's all right. I'm going to buy a home out in California, I think, Rad. Right? Introduce your catcher, though, will you? Joe Glenn, folks. Joe and Joe. Come on in, Joe. I'm a little excited, but I do want to say hello to my folks and to all my friends. It's a great series, and I'm very happy we won. Mark Ross, Mark, Mark, come on over, sir. Here's the secretary of the Yankee Club, ladies and gentlemen, Mark Ross. This is the tenth one for me. I hope we have another one. Make it eleven. Thank you. Hold the court, please. Wait a second. I gotta get something. Wait a minute. Oh no. Hey, here's the mascot. Holy smokes. What's your name? Nobody ever tells them. Huh? Jimmy Sullivan. Jimmy Sullivan. Jimmy, how long have you been mascot for the Yankees? Two years. Listen, you speak for the whole Yankee team now and get going. Come on. Very glad we won, folks. What are you gonna do with all the dough you made? Put it in the bank. What bank? Any bank. Any bank. Uh, well, congratulations, kid. Have a good winter. We'll see you again in the spring. They're still pushing and shoving around here. And the little picture that we got now. Every photographer, I believe, in, in, in America is here in this dressing room of the Yankees, and we pull all the ball players on for you. This is Tom Manning speaking, and I want you to return you again to the dressing room. Back in the NBC booth at the top of the upper deck of the polo grounds, the crowd is streaming out on the field, rapidly making its getaway, and the 1937 World Series is definitely over. But the New York Yankees return world champions for the second year in a row. They have the defeated the New York Giants, champions of the National League, in four out of five games. They managed to do that because they opened up, in a manner of speaking, a long lead by winning the first three games of the World Series before the Giants seemed to be unable to get going at all. To be behind the fine pitching of Carl Hubble, the Giants were able to win and looked very much like they had looked while they were winning a championship in the National League. Today, in this what turned out to be the final game, Lefty Gomez, who won the first game for the Yankees, came back again. He was not the same kind of a pitcher by any means today that he was in the first game, but he managed to withstand the repeated fine starts that the Giants made in several innings and held them to their two runs. The Giants got ten hits off of Gomez, but he kept them fairly well scattered. The main thing that Gomez did today was to show his ability to pitch his way out of trouble, and he was in trouble a good deal, especially in the latter part of the game. He was in most of his trouble, of course, in the third inning when Mel Ott, the New York Giant third baseman, got the Giants' only home run of the series, scoring Dick Bartell ahead of him and tying the score. The Yankees prior to that had made two runs, both on home runs off Cliff Melton. Joe DiMaggio got one of them, and Marl Hogue got the other. Later on in the fifth inning, with the score tied at 2-all, Tony Lazari came through with a tremendous three-base hit in the dead center field. And then nobody else but Gomez himself came up and delivered his only hit of the series, but one that was good enough to knock home the one run that he needed to win the way he went thereafter. Later on in the ball game, or in that inning, Gomez himself scored to make the score four to two. And that was the way it went, although this crowd of a few hundred more than thirty eight thousand that was here this afternoon on a cold, really damp day with a threat of rain all the time, certainly got quite a kick out of the proceedings in the latter innings. There were many chances for the Giants, and the Giants today played very fine baseball all the way through. Perhaps they didn't get the breaks that they wanted, but the chances were there for them to come through. And because they didn't, it seems to me that is a goes on the credit side of Gomez as much on, as on the debit side of the Giants. It has been an interesting series all the way through. And this Warren Brown talking to you must say that he has enjoyed it thoroughly. And now I'm going to turn the microphone over to George Hicks and goodbye.
Again, NBC and its associated stations from coast to coast have brought you under a leaden sky at the Polo Grounds in New York City, the last game of the Autumnal Classic and the complete report of all the action of the series. The Yanks win, of course, four games to one, winning the first game eight to one, the second game eight to one, the third game five to one, the Giants winning the fourth game seven to three, and the Yankees now winning the last game four to two. The Yanks got eight hits and no errors. The Giants got ten hits and no errors. Your two action describers have been Tom Manning, the veteran baseball announcer from station WTAM Cleveland, and Brett Barber, the flashy southern boy of WLW Cincinnati. And Warren Brown, the sports editor of the Chicago Herald Examiner, was that voice of authority between the innings. This is George Hicks speaking from New York. These are programs of the National Broadcasting Company.